and we are live hey everybody welcome to hey, the uh, welcome to the guitar hack live stream i've got with me the awesome rock and dave byron he's he's uh, gonna tell us all about his history how he started playing all that good stuff thank you so much dave for coming on brother Hey, thank you for having me. I feel like a celebrity. I feel like I'm on the Academy <laughs> Rewards, you know? Like give a speech like to thank my friends, my family, my <laughs> mom and dad for accidentally having me. You know? <laughs> yes, you are a celebrity, my friend. Nah, I think all you guys are celebrities. I, I really appreciate it. Before I get uh, before I get started uh, bothering you with a whole whack of questions, let me just uh, say hello to some of the people in the chat here. So we got R2R3 Locky Nut. Hey, buddy, how are you? Fender Guru's in the house, EJ's Guitars, uh, who else we got? We got Gussie Wells, Ben Coombs, buddy, how's it going? Uh, GTV, how are you? Mitch Heyman, how's it going? Everybody's saying hello, Rockin' Dave. Hey, have hello, everybody. You guys hello, totally everybody. rock out there, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Okay, this is fantastic. Okay, so Dave, been watching your channel for a few months now gotten bits and pieces of your history you talk about back in Chicago and this and that so what I like yeah. to know and what you know I'm sure a lot of these people like to know is the history of Dave Byron so I'm gonna start right at the beginning brother what got you playing guitar what got you into music well you know um, as a young kid I was only six years old 1969 and the apartment complex we lived in we had all these hippies playing the electric guitar in the courtyard yeah. you know so right. i thought it was real cool because you know how it looks and how it sounds and everything right so that was kind of like my very first introduction but i didn't start playing guitar till 74 in grade school okay. and it was on an online string guitar and it was all the basic first position chords and right, that right. And, uh, and and see before then i my my, my older half sister had a guitar an acoustic and I was putting my fingers in between the strings and thinking <laughs> that's what you're supposed to do, man. I yeah. had no clue. Yeah. But in uh, in grade school, when I started really learning just basic chords and that, um, I did not own a guitar. So on Thursdays, me and my sister, we'd have our guitar lessons. We'd bring the guitar home for the weekend and mm -hmm. have to practice on it because we had, you know, you know how the schools are. You have an assembly and... You get someone's gonna twist a balloon and all this other crap, you know. Yeah. Well, we had a little guitar assembly, right? So I had to learn all these songs, and um, I just, I, I, what, what, what started with me is I started progressing kind of at a, a rapid rate, not realizing because to me I thought it was cool. I figured out you got to put your finger on the string, not between, not between the strings, you know. So, you're, so you were taking lessons like right off the bat. Yeah, it was only because it was in the, the grade school. But you know what? Oh, in school it was school lessons. Yeah, yeah, in grade oh, school. That's Chicago, amazing, that's which was, it is amazing because nowadays, you know, you, you ask the kids if they take guitar lessons. You know, the guitar is probably one of the most cheapest instrument you could buy for a guitar, you know, for a, a music instrument. But no, they'll have you in band and you got to rent a violin. And if you want to rent a good violin, you look, you're looking at about between 800 to $1,100. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. So yeah, it was in it was in Chicago public schools in grade school, and uh, actually the first song I learned how to play was "Stairway to Heaven," and that was by ear. And it's only because now I hope this won't be too long. I'm just going to give a quick example. Basically, I had to learn for assembly a song that went from a C. Could you guys hear that? Yeah. To A minor. Right. Well, because I had the guitar with me, I figured, well, why don't I learn how to go backwards as well as forwards, you know? So I'd go like this. And my friend, he said, hey, that sounds like that song that my brother Timmy plays all the time. And living in Chicago, the apartments, the houses are right next to each other. So right. I would hear him play Stairway to Heaven like a gazillion times. Let me so just that stuck in my head. Let me yeah. just welcome a few more people that popped in. Yadel, how are you, buddy? Uh, we got uh, Mr. BHB, Junior, Bruce, how's it going? 
Yeah, base Hiroshima Nick. How are you, man? Oh yeah. Cool, cool. Cheers, my friends. Cool, cool. Guitar girl, she just stepped in. How are you, guitar girl? Nice to see you. She's okay. making great progress. Oh yeah. Guitar girl, she's, you're yeah. on the right track. You know what? She's a natural at everything. Yeah, she is. yeah. That's amazing. That is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Very inspiring. So I think what we ought to do, all of us, all of us YouTubers, <laughs> we should make a guitar. How, we should make a a, a, a Kayla Telly. <laughs> Get a picture <laughs> of her and put it on the tail. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. All right. So okay. So you're taking lessons and you're playing at the assembly. Yeah. Yeah, and then you know the first time I played in front of people was was either it had to have been late 1974 because you have the Christmas show. Right. And you know here's the funny thing. There's 300 people sitting in the audience, and then when I tell people my very first gig was when I started playing in school, my friends, especially back in the 80s when we were doing all our shows heavily, the gigs heavily, you know, they would tell me, oh, Dave, you cannot count that because that doesn't count. I said, what are you talking about? There's more people at a school assembly than there are at the bars. Uh, you know? Yeah, you're not going to fit 300 people in a bar that I know. <laughs> no, no. But it was a great experience. It was a lot of fun, and then after that, Everything else was just trial and error. Yeah. And I literally lived down the street from all these famous blues clubs in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And the only one that's really left it, that is literally down the street from where I used to live is uh, Kingston Mines. And a lot of these other places, they folded because, you know, um, two reasons. The economy and then the police would watch these places, man. Because I used to do an open jam at, at Kingston Mines when I was 19. And mm -hmm. they, the manager would ask me, okay, you could sit in on a song or two, but I have to ask you to leave because you're underage. And the cops were watching the places. And just, yeah. they were just, yeah. Did, did you run into any, like, I mean, because that's a hot spot, obviously, for blues. Oh. Did you run into, like, any? I ran into, a, um, let's see. I ran into... Big Twist and the Mellow Fellows before I knew who he was. Mm -hmm. um, Lonnie Brooks before I really knew. My wife ran sound for Lonnie Brooks. Okay. Um, Lefty Diz, who used to play with the Kinsey Report. And these were all like Chicago guys. I never met Buddy Guy. My wife went to Buddy Guy's place. Did you ever meet Buddy Guy, Dad? No, he wasn't there. Um, but, you know, you'd meet these people. Then later on, be like, oh, uh. that's so-and-so. I, I think I met this guy, you know? Mm -hmm. But it's so weird because when you're doing these jam sessions, you know, the places are dark and it's smoky. That's when you could smoke in the bars back yeah. then. And uh, it, it wasn't really about being get, getting stars in the eyes. It was about, oh, this guy could jam. Hey, that's a pretty cool chord progression. You know, let's just jam. And you, you totally forget about all that. So so when did you start, like, playing with with a band like did you like start getting into oh. bands right away or yeah, well, actually that was in high school you know like a lot of us mm -hmm. um and then you know you get the you get the bands that do something and go nowhere you know what i mean um but uh randy gonzalez was a guy i went to high school with him and uh this girl named vanessa she had a killer voice ruben was a bass player and i think jose was the drummer and it was, uh, man, we had a great high school band, you know, but then everyone left and went their own ways. Right. And then started getting into some of the metal scene because where I grew up with, it was more blues and jazz. And then the rock and metal was out in the suburbs, like where R2, R3 Locking Nut lives in Schaumburg, Illinois. Mm -hmm. We used to go to the Thirsty Whale. So I, throughout all those years, I never owned a stack or even a half stack. I had the little PV Special 130 amp, you know. So, so what were the like the the first, you know, when you're when you're starting to play? What were the first guys that like you wanted like that were your influences in your in your in your playing? Oh, man, it was a lot when I you know from Richie Blackmore, of course Jimmy Page, Robin mm -hmm. Trower, um, you know, of course Eddie Van Halen because I was a junior in high school when when the first time when Van Halen one came out, and my well, friend. Yeah, he says, Dave, check this out. So after running with the devil, here comes eruption. And yeah. dude, it just blew the doors off of anything else I heard, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just unbelievable.
But then, you know, also guys like Carlos Santana, because I love the way he phrases, you know. Um, it reminded me of some of the blues guys I used to hear, you know, playing down the street from me. Yeah. And um, But then the guy that really just totally influenced me the most was a uh, jazz fusion guitarist, Al DiMiola. Oh, yeah. And when I heard that, I had just graduated high school in 81. The summer of 81, I met one of my good friends, my best guitar buddy, Andy Rios. And uh, we'd hang out together. And he says, Dave, you got to check this guy out. So he played a couple of the albums with Chick Corea's Return to Forever and then Al Demiola's second album, Elegant Gypsy. And there's a song on there called Race with the Devil. Just wanted, yeah. sorry, I just want to say yeah. hi, Simon Williams. He just popped in to say hello, and now he's going to bed. He's in the UK. <laughs> oh, yeah, Simon. Hey, you have a great night, man. I, you're, you guys are like what, seven hours ahead of us, man. Yeah. 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 Al Miola, that record that you mentioned, I, I heard that record. And I mean, much later, mind you. But, yeah. Oh, my and, God. Know, if, 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 if you go back in time, you know, all that stuff was coming out like, the albums were being released in like 1974, 75. So obviously it recorded 73, 74, you know, because mm -hmm. the, the process takes a while. And if you go back in time, nobody was playing like that. I mean, mm -hmm. it was incredible. And then when I seen him on the acoustic doing that, I was like, holy crap. It was man. like the first shredder. Like the guy, yeah. oh my God, the articulation. Very accurate. And, and, you know, it's not just that he was fast. He had a lot of melody. Yes. Great, great rhythms. And yeah. but when he would play those fast scales, you could actually feel he had very strong hands, you know. Oh, it yeah. wasn't you know, real light picking and oh, yeah, good uh, attack, yeah. Oh, killer attack is like was because back then well yeah, go sorry about that. Sorry, I, I, when you, I just wanted I wanna say hello oh, yeah. to Cheddar Kung Pao's in the house. Hey Cheddar, how are you, buddy? What is happening, man? I love that video he did with uh with your Les Paul, uh with uh Rick uh Roman Alley, mm. the Les Paul challenge. Yeah, that yours was, too. Sorry, that was cool. No, yeah, the, the, that was cool. It was fun doing. That really was cool, man. But yeah, going back to what I was saying. Yeah, see, yeah. Back then, we didn't. You didn't have high high gain amps. You didn't have this stuff, you know. And um, and so my very first electric guitar was a, a Checkmate guitar. It was a piece of crap, right from a pawn shop. Mm -hmm. And my amplifier. Was was like real thin, real tall, about <laughs> that wide, with maybe a six-inch speaker, and you click the volume on, and that's it, just one knob. That was like, it, man. Like AM radio. <laughs> yeah, AM radio, man. It was so primitive. So, to me, all the stuff that that, I mean, I, I there is a difference between some of the stuff that's out there. You know what I mean? But when I go back in time. You could take the cheapest piece of crap that people will call a piece of crap now, and it would be, it would be looked up upon like this back then because of what it could do. Yeah, Brian yeah. Cote, Jason Wade, Jason how Wade, how you doing, buddy? Thanks for popping in. All right, so, so in high school, were the bands that you were in like? I, I mean, obviously you were too young to play bars, but were you guys like doing a? Uh, you know the the dances and stuff like that. Yeah, we started doing the dances and that, and uh, that was a good experience because, see, at that time, you had and I don't know if you guys had this in Canada, the the battle between rock and disco. Oh, they of were, course they, we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. remember the t-shirts? It would said disco sucks, and then the oh, disco yeah. people had rock sucks and all that. So what started happening was before Eddie Van Halen recorded "Beat It." You had bands like Gino Vanelli yeah. and uh, some of these Maybe. other bands. Of course, the trail. Yeah, Cool in the Gang and uh, which and, and Earth, Wind and Fire, which I have a videotape laying around here somewhere with me jamming with one of the original drummers and his cousin that still sits in with Earth, Wind and Fire. Nice. And um, they all played instruments, you know. So even though it was disco, they played instruments. But because he had this battle going on, you know how guitar players are. Everyone, all guitar players like to solo. You know what I mean? Pretty much. <laughs> so what happened was, little by little, it started to morph into that. But we didn't have high gain amps. You know, they didn't come until like later. The uh, the the uh, Marshall uh, JCM eight hundred. I remember when that was coming out. Yeah, yeah. 
And of course, well, you, Judas you, you, the thing was that. back then, like with the earlier marshals, I mean, even today, you got to crank them. You got to crank them. You got to crank them, man. Yeah. That's why I think you're smart with, or I think you said your marshal is what? Is your marshal 50 watts? Your head? Yeah. Or is it 20? Or 50 no, watts? Okay. It's 50, yeah. So, so. Back in the day, I remember a friend of mine, one of the one of the bands I was in later on after high school, his name was Leo. He bought a Marshall half stack, but he couldn't he didn't know if he should get the 50 watt head or the 100 watt head. And we and he had the money, but he wasn't, I don't think I want to spend that much money, you know. Mm. So I told him, I says, Well, crank up the 50 water. He cranks up the 50 water, and because it's only 50 watts, the tubes break up quicker. So yeah, you get more of a muscle sound. Yeah, less head. So yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's always smarter to do it. Uh, if you want, if you want, if you want a hundred watts, the best thing to do is you grab two fifty watt heads, plug into the input of the one. The output goes into the input of the other one. You crank that. Now you got two. You have hundred watts, but it's two fifty watts that are breaking up quicker. When you run into that four twelve cab, look out, man! It's gonna sound massive. So okay, you know, so you're. you're you're in high school and, and you're playing with bands and you're playing the dances and this and that. So when did you make the decision that this is what I want to do? Oh, I, you know what? Almost immediately. Wow. Even back to grade school, almost immediately. But then I also wanted to be a marine biologist because the movie Jaws <laughs> was out, you know, and yeah. I thought this is so cool. You know, when you're a kid, you know, you got a million things going on in your head, what you like to do. Right. But, um, when when I started noticing that um, back then when you could do this for a, a living, you know, that it was, uh, I thought, this is so cool. I love doing this stuff, you know. Yeah. And then in the mid to late 80s, 80s, I think it was 1987, I got in this top 40 band, you know. Yeah. And we were gigging heavily. We would do, we would, some places was five to six sets a night five oh to six God. nights a week man it was overkill how many how many like how long would the set be well we would do 45 minute sets and oh, then we would wow. take a break so you, you guys know, would start what like at seven o'clock yeah and then we'd go till sometimes six o'clock and we go to like maybe may, depending on the place and depending on during the week i think we stopped at 1 30 and then on the weekends, we'd go to like uh, two thirty or three o'clock in the morning. That's insane, like, man. That was insane, and I didn't realize it because you know I'm still young. I'm in yeah, my early twenties, yeah. you know, and I'm having a good time in that. And we were making some good money. Well, you, That's you when we paying the bands. You, you must know? have developed some amazing chops. I mean, you don't realize it, but when you play you that amount of time, play, right? You don't realize it because you're you're playing all the time. Yeah. And because you're playing such a, a wide variety of music, it's That's not just your soloing. It's your rhythm chops now. Exactly. And then one of the, exa exactly. So your whole timing is just, man, like almost spot on. But you don't realize it because you're in that, that moment. And one of the gigs we did was at in Indiana at the Holiday Star Plaza. And we're in the Holodome. And the band were, um, Cameo was playing. They had that hit song, Word I Up. I remember Cameo. Yeah, so we're playing poolside and we're on up. the balcony, they're watching me play, and uh, I thought, okay, that's pretty cool. You know, I felt I felt honored. You know, you you at first you get nervous, you know, because you see someone that's famous watching you play. Right. You know, but then you start getting into the songs because you're you're trying because we never had a set list. The drummer would never have a set list. He'd just call the songs out as we're playing. Oh, you so I had to hurry up and just focus on my pedals and my little amp and, you know, calling up what, what effect I'm going to use and get ready for the next chord progressions and things like that. So you start forgetting about who's watching you and start concentrating because the boss is on your case. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, so I mean, we're watching. I just yeah, we're say, going like, if you're playing that much oh, every yeah. night. Like you guys must yeah. have had a, like a huge library of songs that you could just. Oh my god! Boom. We had about two hundred, maybe I can't remember. Oh, that's crazy, man! I remember he gave me two weeks. This is when we had a radio station with this guy Casey Kasem. You know, every Sunday, top yeah. ten hits. He yeah. told me, "Get your cassette ready, record all those songs. You got two weeks. Here, the first two weeks, here's forty songs. You got to learn them, and here's again. And we never really rehearsed." We'd only get together for like vocal harmonies, and I didn't sing at all. 
and fit in little knickknacks in here. But you know, a lot of what I had to do was stuff going like this, you know. Yeah. That was the music of the day, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I had to like kind of fit in with the what what the keyboard was doing. Just one second, uh, Dave. Sure. I just wanted to welcome some new people that popped in. Zach Thong, how are you doing, buddy? Uh, Rick Hefner, welcome. Hey, Rick. Jeff Underwood, how are you? Jeff Underwood. Yeah. And you really seem to carry Underwood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you mentioned that the other day. Yeah. Brian Stewart just popped in. Hey, Brian, how are you, man? So we got 19 what? people watching. Thanks so oh, wow. much, everybody, for popping in. So when when did you get your first? Because you're mentioning, you know, you, you had these pawn shop guitars. When did you get your first really good instrument? Well, I went from the pawn shop guitar to a Magnum Les Paul copy that was okay. You know yeah. what I mean? Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until I got my my Ibanez artist guitar, and I bought that in 1979, and um, it was a 78 model, and I didn't realize this until just fairly recent when I did some research on when did Ibanez really start on their own. Right. That Ibanez artist was one of the series that was the first run of them being 100% on their own, and it was a kick-ass guitar, man. Yeah. And I traded in for a whammy bar, and, I, and it was another Ibanez whammy bar guitar, but much lesser quality, you know. So I kicked myself for that. But, yeah, that was my first good guitar. And then I was trying to save up to get a Lab Series amp, the L3. Mm -hmm. I think Gibson made Lab Series. But I got impatient. I had to put everything on layaway, you know. That's how it was back then. Yeah. So I was getting all impatient, and then they had the crates amps. And they were shaped like a crate box. I remember so the I crates. Figured, well, that's better than the amp with the one volume that just went click. <laughs> So yeah. I grabbed that thing, and you know that was that was basically it. So, but my first effect pedal was the Ibanez um, PSA to weight tube screamer. Yeah, when yeah. it first came out, it was only thirty five bucks, and then no one liked it because it wasn't much of a distortion pedal, you know. Well, yeah, it's it's not. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's, for, it, yeah. it's yeah, exactly. So. That's cool. Then you graduate, you know, as time goes on. But you know what? I remember back then. MXR, they did have a multi effects unit very similar to, um, I think it's TC Electronics or one of them that has the uh, called the fly rig. It's got all the foot switches and the knobs. Mm -hmm. And MXR had one out and it was like maybe, well, it had to been 1980 or 81 because I graduated in 81 and the guy in high school had one. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So they were coming out with all that stuff back then, but you know, it wasn't really taking off. So, um, but then, so you graduated high school, and then where, where did you go from there? Did you start immediately? Like, did you have a bed? Because I know you you also did a little bit of traveling in that. Yeah, well, we did that much after we started doing oh. traveling. That first when I met when I met my wife, mm -hmm. and uh, what what was going on is that you know you get in this band, it plays a little bit, you know, for a little while, then the band breaks up. And then you get in another band, you make the demo tapes. You know, you spend all this money in the recording studio, you get the cassette demo tape. Cassette. And the first thing you hear when you play, hit play is shh, <laughs> and then the band starts, you know? Yeah. So, you know, we did all that. And, you know, sometimes some of us, you know, you, when you're young, you do stupid things, you know, hang out with the wrong people, blah, 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 you know. But I, I remember doing everything I was supposed to do Send you know we give out you send a fee a twenty twenty dollar fee or something like that, and to get your your cassette tape in the hands of this person in the hands of that person and then you you find out later on when you look back you spend all this money and no one did anything for you and now knowing what I know now if I knew that back then I could have saved all that money and paid my way through yeah Bought my way through because that's really what it is. Pulse Country, how are you? Thanks for joining in, man. Hey, how's it going, man? So, Dave, we got 24 people watching now. What's happening, guys? You guys totally rock. 24. Well, everybody. Thanks for popping in, man. Thank Is that you. like having two 12-packs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I don't even drink. It's a 2-4. Yeah. It's a 2-4. That's it, man. What do we call them? Scarborough Suitcase. Um, 
Okay, so um, so were so were you like in a in a in a touring band? Well, we were almost going to be touring in one of the bands that I was in. Right. And it was we spent money, we spent money, we spent money to the point where it was at, it was at a breaking point. Uh -huh. And this is when I was like, okay, screw this, you know, I, I'm spending way too much money. And um, when I met my wife, that band was supposed to, we were supposed to be good to go on a tour. Geffen Records. Well, let me let me retract. Yeah, yeah. Back in 1989, one of the bands I was in, um, I can't give any names because it's their band, so that's why I'm not giving any. No know. problem. But um, Geffen Records was going to be looking at us, and I really didn't know anything because everything was, we had this guy that was going to manage us. And then he was going to help us, but then he didn't want to spend any money because he had a drinking problem. So his money was going somewhere else, you know? <laughs> so, but there was still strong interest because we were getting radio play on a, a local station called VVX. Mm -hmm. And strong interest. And the guitar player was getting burnt out from this, the waiting game, you know, the phone call that never comes in. And, yeah. you know. He was just getting burned out, and the bills were piling up, and then then everyone had to go back to the day jobs, and then still try to support this. Right, right. You know, that, that's what kills it. A lot of it, it kills it. Oh yeah. So, um, and then I started realizing, you know, if I don't do this on my own, I think that would be the best thing to do. But then I started realizing it takes money. And when I met my wife, she said the same thing. Now my wife used to go to the NAM shows out in Anaheim, California. Mm -hmm. and she, one of the things her company was doing they'd make custom built speakers they have some of them still at Epcot Center down here and mm -hmm. then she made some custom cabinets for the band Wasp they were doing some kind of a some type of a deal out in California and because they, one of their managers saw my wife's company at the NAM show they liked the speakers she made some speakers for them and got invited to that gig but she didn't want to go to it because she said you know these after after NAM parties, they're let's see how can I put it, they're cool, but then they're not cool. It's kind of like inviting you in an area that you'd want to be in, but mm -hmm. now, and not all of them are like this, but you get some of these people. But now they're gonna let you know that you're small. You know what I mean? And they're mm -hmm. above you. Mm -hmm. And then at, you can only take that for so long. It's like you know what? Wait a minute. I bought all your albums. I bought all your T-shirts. I went all your cards. I see, you know, my money did have something to do. Maybe real small, but something to do with you getting to where you're at, as long as well as all my friends' money. You know what I mean? Yeah. So when I started seeing how funny things were getting, I was like, you know what? This is crazy. We got a couple so, more people. Sorry, sorry, yeah. Dave. We got a couple more people jo joined in. Scotty G, how's it going, buddy? Nine Fathoms, how are you? Nine Phantoms, what's happening, buddy? Yeah, so we've got uh, we got twenty four people watching now. Nice, nice. Great. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate it, and I appreciate yeah. this guitar act. Hey, man. Um, no worries, but, brother. So then, when I met my wife, um, and and I've only been to one Nam show at nine nineteen eighty nine, and I'll tell you what, that's when I got this endorsement deal. Where it was, I didn't have to pay a dime out of my pocket. The guy had 10 guitars lined up. He tells me, you pick whatever one you want. It's yours. I'm thinking, I, I couldn't believe it. Because what, I didn't. What time it was a company called Monroe Custom Guitars. Okay. It, they had, they, one of their guitars was shaped like a lightning bolt. And he used to advertise in guitar for the practicing musician and guitar world. Uh -huh. And he had a full color ad. Well, I just, I, my friend got me into the Gibson booth. And back then, Gibson had this thing. They had another company called, I think it was called Photon or something like that. It was a rack mount guitar synthesizer. Okay. And every string on the guitar was a B string, tuned to B. Every single string. It was the weirdest thing. That is weird. Yeah. And it didn't even feel right. It didn't track right. And I had to pretend like I liked it <laughs> because my friend was the keyboard player, but uh -huh. he didn't know how to play guitar well. So he, he has me come in, right? right, right. And I'm sitting there and, you know, 
I, I met a lot of I met a lot of people. Eddie Van Halen was there, but I didn't get a chance to meet him. Mm -hmm. But uh, I met a lot. I've Jen with Adrian Vandenberg in the PV booth. Oh, there's a monster and, player. Oh yeah, he's a monster player, man. A monster yeah. player, and you know some really great guys there. But um, but then he. That's when I got this deal with with the uh, Monroe Custom Guitars, and because it's a custom made guitar, there was mm -hmm. no serial number. Right. Later on, I had it for about a year, and it got ripped off. Ah. And then the deal went down. It, it went south, not because Robert was, you know, he he was running out of money because he was putting all these ads in these magazines, mm -hmm. and he'd say, "All right, Dave, I'll, I'll, I'm going to fly you down to Cal to California, then down to Texas, because he was from Texas." It'll be on a shoestring budget, and we'll see. If we get this this thing up and going, you know. I said I really appreciate this. I'll do whatever it takes, man. You know to help you out. But because he was not a known company, I go to the guitar centers and the guitar shacks, and you had ESP, Jackson, Charvel, and all of them were telling me, "Well, it's a nice guitar, but we don't know that brand, so we cannot mm -hmm. carry it." You know. Yeah. And then yeah. Uh, I guess it was a Korean company bought him out. So he had to sell his company. Mm -hmm. you know, that's how that goes. So you know what I mean? It's like you get just that close to getting a deal, then it goes down the tubes. So it felt like all my life, getting that close, it goes down the tubes. And then when I met my wife, she says, you know, let's just do it ourselves. It really comes down to money. Because she's been self-employed for like 25 years. Right, and right. And she's been telling me the only difference between music and any other business is that it is, it's a different product. But it's still a business, right? So, and, so at that at that point, like you were on your own, like that's when you sort yeah. of left the bands and all that yeah. behind. Because then we started getting our I, people call them tours. A tour is when you go out x amount of days. We would go out and come back, but we would travel all over. So I right. call them road shows. Uh -huh. So, but that's when I realized, okay, if you have the band, and then. The weekend before you go out to gig, to you know, to do your road shows, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, so-and-so gets into a fight, my singer's girlfriend's mad at him, now he can't go out and play, or mm -hmm. something's always happening, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And yeah. then, boom, down the toilet it goes. And it's all downtime, all downtime. And because I also play classical guitar, mm -hmm. that's that really is what gave me a lot of work playing that style, the classical and flamenco style. So when you were so when you were going out and doing all these shows, these were all solo shows then. They were all solo shows, and then I started also incorporating the backing tracks before we had loop pedals. Because I got this idea because I was still self-producing. We were self-producing our CDs at home, right? Because I got tired of spending all this money and then being told you got to wait until some someone with supersonic ears hears your CD and discovers you, but yet you still spend all this money. So Deb said, "Hey." Let's just package it and sell it ourselves. And tell Mr. Spock comes with his supersonic gears and signs us. We'll go out and make money. Uh, Frank Corcoran. Sorry, sorry, Dave. Frank oh, no, Corcoran. Good night. Good night, Thank my friend. Going to bed. Thanks for popping in, Frank. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. But so, so you've been basically on your own since uh, the late... 80s then early 90s well yeah I, actually since the late 80s and then one of the last metal bands we had was uh late 90s early 2000s um and then that's the one we were really trying to push and it was another you know no matter how hard you push it's a one closed door after another closed door right but then the singer left and then five years after that i think this was 2006 we see him at ozfest and he's going around giving away his CD because they got signed to a company called Hellion Records in Germany. But right. they only had a one CD deal. Mm -hmm. Well, their guitar player got mad and left and owed the guy money to go over there and play or whatever it was. So he remembered that I don't drink, I don't smoke, I can learn the songs fast, blah, blah, blah. So he says, hey, Dave, you want to fill in? I says, okay, we'll check it out. Mm -hmm. Go through all the rehearsals. Deb's taking the pictures with the band as, along with their manager <laughs> and the guy that we would have sent our photos for band photo to get used for the advertisement. Right. He liked Deb's picture better than the, their manager's picture right. and because Deb's a girl. The guy leaves a message on my phone. Dave, you got to pick either your wife or us like this. 
this world ain't big enough for the both of us. I'm like, now how stupid is this? It's what do you picture, think? Man. Yeah, it's a picture. But you see what I mean? So I, here I come with the diapy wipies and the pacifiers, you know, <laughs> and all this other stuff. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. So I just said, okay, that's it. And then, like, right after that, we started doing all our road shows. Uh, so I just somebody. Oh, Soda Pop. Soda Pop it's just soda popped pop. in. Hey, Soda Pop, how are you, man? Yeah, so, okay. you know, yeah, if you get into that. That whole band drama thing, yeah, it, I, 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 I know exactly what you're talking about. It's really hard. Oh, it's hard. You know, it's it's, it's the same so thing. You know, it's so. But when we do our road shows, you know, we're driving from Illinois to Texas. We we've done a show up in Canada. I forget what part of Canada. Yeah, I forgot. It was in not February. Far, it's not far from Niagara Falls. Not far from Niagara Falls. Okay, That's right around the border. Yeah. Yeah, right around the border there. And we went up to do a gig. It was a private gig, too. And oh, yeah. then the guy asked, Well, where are you staying at a hotel? He says, No, we're driving right back to Chicago, Illinois. He just couldn't <laughs> believe it, man. In the wintertime. Yeah, so yeah. I have all these pictures of Canada. It's all white, right? Snow. Because of the snow. Then you see the Canadian flag. And then you see, you know, where you pass the borders, you know? Yeah. Border patrol. And then come on back, you know? Yeah. But, um, but that must have been like. To be a one-man band back then, because I mean, now you got well, you have all the gear that you have now, and you oh, got I have all the gear, so I have to do with CDs and all this and kind of stuff. But back then, that must have oh, been because yeah. you'd have to literally record all your backing stuff because there That's was no. Was doing. Yeah, because I didn't have access to YouTube or anything. Like we, what that YouTube exists. wasn't around. Yeah. So I would take the chord progressions. And then mess with my, you know, program my drum machine. Which I know people don't like drum machines, but you know, when you got the gigs that they're good, they're willing to to hire you. Now you gotta you gotta go, you know. Right. So you have to do whatever it takes and make it sound as as good as possible. So we marketed it as a guitar show. You know, right. there's gonna be a drum machine, you know, but it's a guitar show. And then in conjunction with that, I play my classical and flamenco guitar. So when people would think that I'm cheating. Or something like that. Then I started playing something on the classical guitar, and they're like, "Oh, okay, this guy can really play then, you know." And then they would tell me, "Hey, you're cheating." I says, "No, cheating is when you're married and you got something on the side. That's cheating. I'm being resourceful." <laughs> but I gotta show you this picture because I just found this one of the gigs we did. And it was really a vacation, but I take the guitar with me. We're down in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. Was uh, I don't know if you could see this. There's yeah. me and there's Michael Anthony from Van Halen. Nice. And I didn't know he was there. He's there. I'm playing poolside in the, in the pool with my wife and our friends is Michael Anthony. And uh, this was the same year we were going to audition for uh, TSL, Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Ah, okay. So we send them the material and Deb had a nice cover letter and we're easy to work with. We understand our, our place, you know. Because yeah. they don't want somebody that's egotistical because no one gets a job like that, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, one, I was just going to say, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, like, you know, for you to, to keep it going for as long as you have, like, that takes a lot of perseverance, man. You know, I, what it, yeah, what it really is, is that to me, this is a gift from God. I don't take it for granted. I just have a lot of passion for it and a lot of drive. And I really think when I look back, when I would hear people say that, I think, yeah, you got to have drive. You got to have this. Okay. But then when you really like what you're doing, you kind of forget about all this and mm -hmm. you don't let anything get in your way, you know. And at the end of the day, when you're in, at, in your house rehearsing and, and, you know, going over some new chord progressions and all these ideas, what happens is that mindset takes over anything that's negative right. because you really love what you're doing mm -hmm. and people will always see that you know well, you, you could play, you could play every cover song every number one cover song that's ever been written and i guarantee you could have people that's not like what you're gonna do well you know, you know? like that's you know i mean like i was saying i've been watching your channel for the last uh this last few months and uh and when you do those gigs man like for you to be still so enthusiastic, even That's when right. you do your, your live streams, man, you are so pumped. <laughs> you know, I, I, I just, doing it. And you know, I, I'll, I'll tell you what. Out at all. 
Like, you know, <laughs> what I mean? like you're not burnt out at all. Like, it's like, this is the greatest thing in the world. Like, it's, it's you know what it is? to me, it's still like when I, I remember when I first started playing and when I got my first electric guitar, that whole wow factor has stayed with me. You know, yeah, it's obvious. It's like, you know, how when you're a kid and you got the headphones on or the quadraphonic stereos and you're trying to play like you're rocking out to kiss because me and my friends used to do that, you know, <laughs> and uh, it's like. Being able to recreate that vibe, and yeah. I know some people think it's stupid or whatever. I don't care. It's just all about having fun, you know. Exactly. And, and that's what it's all about. And people, they start sensing that, and next thing you know, hey, you know, they start hiring you, and then you get some people don't like what they're what you're doing, and that's fine too. That's okay. I don't take it personal. Yeah. You know. Well, you know, so the, the big one of the most surreal gigs that we did was. Uh, because we did a lot of traveling from Texas. We've done Texas shows down there like five or six times. And one of them, it was a big festival and it got canceled. People are flying from uh, Canada, from France, from Ireland. It was this big World United Music Fest. Mm -hmm. And then it gets canceled and ooh, people were pissed, man. Holy crap. But one of the most, the biggest gigs that we did was the NATO gig over in Brussels, Belgium. Wow. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. That's I couldn't amazing. believe it. Because, you know, you would think that your big break, okay, you're going to play, let's say, uh, um, at, at uh, what the hell is it? The place where Hendrix burned his guitar, you know, in California. Or you're going to play Madison Square Garden, you know. Or, or you know, these, um, you, you know, that's what you envision, but you never expect something like this, you know. Yeah. It's a different type of um, set of celebrities. Yeah. And um, so... The gig we played at there was called the Three Star Lounge, and it was within NATO, but a little bit outside it, but still within the confines. Right. So I have video footage of that, but they won't. We actually ate in their cafeteria and went through, you know, actual NATO, and they don't let you take any pictures, man. The first thing you do, you have two check-in points. The outside check-in point, they take your phone, pat you down, then you go through another check-in point, and you go through this long corridor, man. And it's you got all these people with their M sixteens and representing different parts of the world. It's scary, man. And so well, I'm playing I'm playing there and you know, it's in a, a nice dark lounge and it's real ugly and the Europeans love to drink. I don't drink at all, man. They had this big round table with nothing but all these fine wines and champagnes and that. I'm like, I don't drink, I don't want to insult these people, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm playing and as I'm playing, I'm looking, you got all these people, man, that you'd see on T V, you know. On, your, on the news, and there they are sitting right in front of you, you know? So, That's oh, cool, man. Then the next gig that was really cool was uh, the one for Kentucky Derby, where we got our picture taken with uh, Kate Upton, swimsuit model of the year for Sports Illustrated. Yeah. Dude, I'm uh, playing on the rooftop, and they said there's going to be celebrities, and, and Deb says, okay, what, the mayor, the governor, okay. Yeah. I didn't realize everybody from ESPN comes in, and, you know, I don't really follow sports because I'm always playing. So I have these, their names, I don't remember. But then the door opens and you get these ladies walking in and I thought they were call girls and I told Deb, I said, <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble and get arrested, man. I'm just a guitar player, man. What is this? <laughs> and then the uh, sheriff comes in and he's, the you know, one of the bodyguards fine. and Kate Umpton and then so I'm like, oh, okay. That's funny, man. Yeah, so it was, it's it's a trip. But it's, it, oh, and another gig we did was inside the Indiana Colts, his house. The owner of the Indiana Colts. Nice. I for the for for this fundraiser, mm -hmm. and stupid me because I you know I mean I know the Chicago Bears and the Packers you know what I mean that's about yeah. it right. So we're doing this gig in Indiana, and we're at what would be like the guest house, and that was huge. His mansion is huge enough, right? But we did a lot of these mini mansion gigs, private gigs. So after a while, you don't know who is who. So I'm there playing. And he's got this huge basketball court in this in his guest house. But mm. as where I was set up, they had this big marble like granite top with like the Super Bowl emblem on there. So I had no idea, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm playing and there's this older guy talking with me and yeah, you sound pretty good there, son. How do you like the party? I says, This is great. He says, you know, everybody's real nice and this is a beautiful house and this is a great cause and I just feel so honored to be here, you know. Yeah. So he, he says, oh, well, I'll, I'll catch you. I'll talk with you later. And I said, I'll talk with you later. So nice meeting you. Yeah, you have a good day, right? 
So another guy comes up to me, he says, hey, so what do you think of that guy? He goes, he's a real nice guy, older gentleman, real nice. You know mm -hmm. who he is? No. He says, that's the owner of the Indiana Colts. Wow. I had to do it. He's like, holy crap. I just wanted to uh, say hello to American Devil. He popped in as well. American Devil, buddy. American Devil, we were just talking about you earlier, man. Oh, You're I love your man. stuff, man. Your stuff is I mean, awesome, brother. That's why I don't mind when people, it's so easy for me to put it in my loop pedal and it's their originals and just, you know, put them up at our live gigs because I really believe in helping, you know, everybody out as much as I can, mm -hmm. you know, and it's all about networking and, and you'd be surprised. You could get people at the bars like, you know, you could be playing your heart out, your best guitar solo, and they're still talking about what's on TV and it's some, it's Jerry Springer. Yes, Jerry <laughs> Springer. You know what I mean? The only people that care about my guitar solos are other guitarists, and they're usually not in the audience. So that's about yeah, it. I know. It's, it's, it's crazy. But I do get some response with some of the songs that I play, and I'll announce it. This is American Devils, or uh, this is Dim Dietrich, or Joe Wentz, or that young girl from uh, Denmark, Philippa. Mm -hmm. I think that's so cool because, you know, she reminds me of when me and my sister started playing. And back then, we had no one helping us out, you know. Now it's a different platform, you know. So anyone who wants their stuff played, they. So I just oh, yeah. wanted. To, yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to open up to the chat. If anybody has any questions for Dave, just post them in the chat. American Devil is saying thanks. No, thank you, man. Keep them coming. <laughs> yeah, they rock, man. Your they stuff rock. rocks, brother. American Devil rocks. He certainly does. Yeah, subscribe to this channel. Subscribe to everybody's channel. Yeah, sub to everybody's channel. That yeah. I mean, uh, there's some crazy good stuff out there, man. Oh, there is. And again, with Guitar Girl, Caleb, the progress she's making is awesome. Yeah, you know? know. And she nailed when about talking about simple string bands. That's that's what makes things sound musical. You know. Uh, if I can just. <laughs> As simple as that. Yeah. It's got to sound musical. Hey, Terry. Dave's not Terry, here. Man. <laughs> Even That's Terry. Cool. Terry G, G's and G, right? So he's sitting there with his, with his one of his, his, his SG, a lot of times, um, and then his, his PV uh, Viper and just playing away. You don't have to be a shredder. You could just no. do something that's interesting, and it's it catches my ear. No, you don't. No, yeah, you don't have to be a shredder. You just got to play with intent. You well, know. Yeah, that's what it is. That's what it is. You got to play with intent and just you know be musical, right? That's it. Because really, cool. music is is expression of emotion. That's mm -hmm. why I'm not really too keen on. I know what music theory is, but see, I know where my notes are laid out, and when these people want to talk, you know, deep into theory, I respect it, but. Well, you know as well as I, when's the last time when you played at a bar, people, anyone, the whole crowd came up to you and said, I want to hear the A of minor 13th, <laughs> platinum 9th, sharpened 11th with a dominant set. No one cares. I don't Nobody know what the cares. hell, I lost you after A. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, I don't know what they're talking I have to bring out the yeah. book. And then you find out, you know, you find out something like this. And it sounds like crap, you know that's what I mean? It's crap. like. Hey Hadley Scott McIntyre, thought thanks for popping in, man. So we got twenty six people watching. Yeah, so I'm gonna open up the floor. If sure, anybody yeah. has questions for for Dave or myself, but I think you're yeah. better asking Dave than me. But anyway, yeah, let us know. I hate the god. Oh, Soda Pop hates the goddamn word shredder. Shredder. You know what? Before that term was ever used, it was like you play fast scales. That's it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I think what happened was that the whole shredding thing just got so bombarded, you know, and it got to the yeah. point where it became like this competition. And, you know, there, there's there's good, healthy competition where you help each other out, and then you get the bad competition that is uh, almost purposely trying to put other people down. And I think that's what ruins it, you know? Well, that's, yeah. yeah, the whole competitive thing. I mean, 
I don't know, I'm a little bit older. So you can, I mean, when you're younger, you know, you tend to do that, but you get older, you kind of outgrow that and you just yeah. you know, appreciate people for what they do. Cause everybody bring, you know, has something to offer, right? Exactly. You don't have to be the technically the best guitar player. I mean, you know, as long as, again, as long as it's musical and you're playing with intent, it's worthwhile. It's worthwhile. You know, that's what it is. Um, if you ask anybody, if you if everybody, and I know everyone plays in the chat, if they were to take one note and just do a bend, you know, just that one note, everyone's going to sound different. They could play the exact same gear. But they're going to sound different because everyone attacks the strings different. And mm -hmm. as you play, your emotion is different for what, whatever that note is. You know what I mean? It, it's and funny you mention that because I was watching a, a, a video earlier today. It was from GitCon. And it was Shane and the Blues teaching the Tone King. Tone King, yeah. Blues lick. Yep. And so Shane plays it one way. And the Tone King, he gets it, and he's playing the exact same notes, but it doesn't sound the same. It doesn't sound the same. Because he's putting his spin on it, and that's the thing. Exactly. Like, you can't, you know, so even when you're even when you're playing, like, note for note, say, someone's lead, it's never going to sound like that guy. No, it's dude, never going to sound like that guy, you know. Yeah. Plus, uh, I messaged um, Shane, and he messaged me back. I was about his the, the Ibanez jazz box he was playing, but he was playing off of the same Houston Kettner edition blue sixty, mm -hmm. and I was just gonna do it, put a video up on it. I, I got I got a video on it, or you know, a few videos back, but he said, yeah, he's gonna do a video review. So because he's gonna do a video review, I'm not. I'll wait till after him because I want to show him, you know, respect. Yeah, but um, so how do you like your Houston Kettner? I I like it a lot. Um, I've got the uh, the tube meister. Yeah, it's a it's a thirty six watt head. Like there's you know then they came out with the grand meister, which has got so many bells and whistles on it, and just a lot more stuff than I'll ever need. So the tube meister for me is fine, and it, it sounds really good. I did a video a while back where I beat it with the Marshall, and they actually saw sound, that. Yeah, they yeah. actually sound pretty close. And there's certain things a Marshall does better, and there's certain things that the Hughes and Kettner does better, right? Yeah. But the Hughes and Kettner, man, I like that I don't have it with me here. Oh, actually, I do. It looks it's a toy. If you look at it, it's so small. It's very small. It's tiny and it's light. It's you know like a lunchbox head, which is like that's the thing now. It's all lunchbox heads. Like that really took off. Oh and, yeah. And, you know, like, well, you know that you don't need that much power. Like, well, they don't want you to play that loud in these places. They yeah. could you please turn down? Could you tell the drummer to turn down? And he's yeah. not playing an electronic drum kit. <laughs> yeah. You, know you just got to be heard over the drums. And, like, I, I played a show last Saturday in a, in, a, in, in a bar. And, actually, I went live from the bar a little bit and so people could see. Like, it was a pretty big, big place. You had a good crowd there, too, man. Pretty yeah, it wasn't, crowd. wasn't bad. It was a slow night. Even the owners came up to us and said, because that was Thanksgiving weekend, right? And they said, you know, we had a bad night last night. And we're not expecting a lot of people. We we ended, I think, I think we hit about 40 or 50. So anyway, okay. but I had the Marshall head, the, the 50 watt head, and I, I don't I didn't go past one. That's, That's what I mean. To be. Yeah. You know, so 36 watts is plenty loud. You yeah, know, if I bring like that one, I might go to one and a half. You know. Yeah, right. Exactly. Well, yeah, my amp goes to one and a half. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah, it's like you said, as long as you could be at the drummer's volume, you know what I mean? Yeah. And and you know, honestly, people are starting to appreciate it more because then they could talk with each other when they want to. It's nothing worse than. You know, you're in a small place and you got like nothing but a wall of marshals, you know, down the sidelines behind you and they're, they're all on cranking loud. It doesn't it doesn't make any sense, you know. Yeah, no, it's it's yeah, I mean you know, you just you, you just wanna be again, you just wanna be heard and, and people don't wanna be clubbed over the head with sound either. No, no. You know what I mean? And you know, all those gigs, all the road shows we did when we did the Texas gig, man, we, we brought the half stack. We brought three guitars with us. We brought a PA monitor, um, our pedals. 
because I, over the years I've learned it's real hard to trust a, a sound guy. You know what I mean? Because if they don't like you, if they're a frustrated guitar player, they're going to mess with your sound, man. Guaranteed. I, so, I, got, I got beefs with sound. And not, not most of the times, most of the bars we play, like we're, you know, we're our own shop. We bring our own yeah. PA and all that. But when, you know, sometimes some of the places they'll have a sound guy and they they really pissed me off. I mean, the last time I had a sound guy and he had a great board. It was a beautiful setup, real professional. Anvil actually played there the weekend before we played there. Oh, nice. Yeah, and, I remember Anvil. Yeah, I remember Anvil. Yeah. And uh, anyways, so the guy's like, he mic'd my, my cab. I got a 212 cab. He mics it. And then he's telling me, like, well, you're too loud. You're too loud. I think I was on one or two on the stage just to get stage volume. And what the guy go does is he turns off my mic. So I wasn't coming through the PA. And then when I, when I, some, you know, I recorded it. And when I listened to it back, the guitar sounded tiny. And I took two amps. And he turned the mic off both amps. So instead of me, and I, I was just the single guitar player. So instead of coming out nice and fat, I was like paper thin. I was so oh, pissed off. Like you oh, made, I know made me sound like shit. It doesn't matter. You know, I could have played the best I ever played in my life, but nobody heard it. It was no one heard it. Exactly. I, I had the so same thing happen to me a couple of times. We do this outdoor gig uh, when, when we were still up in Illinois. And this guy, for whatever reason, he didn't like me. And it was the first time I met this guy. I go to shake his hand. He turns the other way. I'm like, what, do I got bad breath or something? I mean, what is it, you know? Some people are just like that. Mm -hmm. So he was constantly messing with my sound. And... Uh, that was the first gig we did. We did a a, a gig in in um, in uh, Minnes no in Minneapolis. No, I'm sorry, St. Louis, Missouri. So we drove four hours. We played for five. Drove back for four. Got maybe a twenty minute rest. Then went and did this gig. I opened up as a solo rock, and I was running on adrenaline. And then I played with the uh, the church band, but it was a metal band. Mm. And then. Within the band, I know what you mean by that tiny guitar sound because we recorded it when I listened to the playback. The guitar sound sounded nothing like my stage sound I had, yeah. you know? Frustrated. Real small, like a little fly flying yeah, around. Like, like, yeah. Yeah. Just, just like one, one. Just one yeah. second, Dave. We got a few new people that popped in. Jim Gidry, how are you, sir? Jim, how are you doing, buddy? Mark Dillon, thanks for popping in, guys. Appreciate it. Pooh Ninja. Pooh Ninja. He's in the house. We got 29 people watching. Sweet. Thanks, everybody, for popping in. Oh, exactly. Thank you so much. Jim Geetra used to get gig out a lot back in the day. Mm. He's a guitar player. Jim, he's a, man, great guitar player. Yeah, like, there, there's some phenomenal. Oh, yeah. In the you house know, some, I think what is so cool with, with, um, with YouTube, now – like a uh, broken change, he'll do recordings, and Jim Geecher will do uh, recordings, and they'll be right in their house, and then they'll just put the videos up. Yeah, and playing with the band. because it is tough when you're traveling, man. It is tough. We would how many times we had spend the night in our car? We'd stop at the truck stop to take a shower because you see, we drive from let's say Minnesota, from uh, Illinois up to Minnesota, then back down to uh, through to Indiana. And you don't have time to spend, you know, at a hotel. And then people would ask me, well, why don't you fly? I said, do you know how expensive it is to put gear on an airplane? Yeah. You wouldn't have any money. You'd well, be in the ride. You'd be playing for free. You'd be playing for free. Exactly. Yeah. So you'd have to drive, and then we'd stop at the rest areas, try to get some rest, you know, and then hit the road again. And, oh, man, it gets brutal. It's a lot of fun. And you get to see a lot of, you know, a lot of cool people. Yeah, but, the, the travel part is the pain in the butt. Oh, yeah. And then sometimes you're playing, and then you got to watch the time zones. If you forget you're in a different time zone, oh, man, and you yeah. think you got an hour left, and you find out, holy crap, I'm supposed to be, I got five minutes before I get on stage. That's when you're hitting the panic button, and you're rushing. And you're already tired. Now mm -hmm. that you got to play tired, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's... It's part of the territory, but that's what's nice about this platform. People really don't have to do that anymore because you can't mm. make any money. Yeah, yeah. 
There Super used to be a, a company called Giggy, because we've done this a couple of times, where we actually did a, a concert from our house, and I think we were selling tickets, and people were buying and watching it online. No, that's cool. Yeah. So I don't know if that company's still up and, and about now, you know. So if anybody in the chat's got any questions for Dave... We're going to go for a couple more minutes here. I know, uh, I think Johnny Bean's firing up about now, so. I respect everybody's time, too, you know. I respect everybody out there. I think this is really, really cool, man. Yeah, like, if you haven't already subbed to, to everybody else, by all means, go ahead. If you haven't subbed to Dave, definitely go for that. I'll put a link. Uh, I think I may already have your link, but if not, I'll, I'll put a link to Dave's channel below. Yeah, and sub the guitar hack, man. Yeah, if you have, thanks, man. Yeah, if you haven't subbed to me, uh, sub, uh, ring the bell so you know. Uh, we'll let you know when dinner's ready. Hit that bell. <laughs> You'll know when, uh, when my vids come up, you know. like Motel, motel time. Yeah. <laughs> Please subscribe and like my channel, and the same for it, Dave, man. and the same for everybody else. Let's keep this, uh, keep this community growing, and let's stay supportive and positive, man. That's what this is Absolutely. all about. Because, you know, I really think we're on the cutting edge of something. It's kind of like the new res revolution, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. we're kind of right in that, that front door right there. And, you know. Like, well, when did you start your YouTube, this this particular? Well, this particular channel, we started, I think, back in, I think back in February. I have to look. Because, uh, was, was it that? December. Oh, in December. Okay, it was in December. Uh -huh. Because the first video I put up, I just... You know, I was so new to this. Oh, I could do a video from my phone. Let's see if I can see if I could upload it. It That's was me putting my. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's like what the hell is this? What's this button do? <laughs> and then you get real nervous because you don't want to get the crumbling or something. You know, like he's the Russians. The Russians. Yes. <laughs> just see no. his big finger going on the screen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that was the first time, but. My other channel, we've had, we've got all kind of videos, and a lot on that other channel, you'll see me doing these songs for these weddings, but I'm taking, like, the main melody, because the, uh, when I would do the reception, you're not going to play the whole song, so we would do this song, send it to the bride, see if she liked it, she could critique it, send it back to me, and then we'd do what we need to do, and of course, that would always be, it would always be different, right, the day of the wedding gig, you know? Yeah, but I had this. I had this one wedding, and I want to share this real quick. We uh, we did this in uh, again in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. We did the uh, rehearsal, and she wanted all these Bach pieces and Baroque pieces, and everything was so different. Each song, she had like twelve songs oh, for man. each person, and it was all totally different. So she had me set up. And it was this long corridor with these big pillars. So during the rehearsal, I could see who's coming down the aisle. So I knew who, what, what song to play. Right. The morning of, thank God we got there early because the person that was the wedding coordinator, she says, hey, the bride wants you way over here. Now, the only thing I see is this big pillar. I don't know who's coming down, what's <laughs> oh, going on. Man. I'm trying to guess. My wife is running back behind the pillar saying, you got to play this song. Canon and B. No, no. Fox Beret and E minor. Okay. You you just try to fumble. I don't know if, if you've you know, playing finger style guitar is one thing. And but the Baroque period and like the Bach pieces, it's like the rhythms are so different, man. Yeah. Because the, the day before, two days before, you're playing rock and metal, and that next thing you know, yeah. you gotta jump That's into this. So oh, it's totally different. Absolute mayhem. How are you, buddy? Thanks for popping in. The legend continues. Absolute mayhem. Absolute mayhem. Great guy, man. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Okay, uh I think uh we're gonna be wrapping this up. If anybody's got any last uh last minute questions for Dave. Last witches, last rights. <laughs> oh, here's a question for you, Dave. It's uh, this is from Jeff Underwood. Question for Patriotic Dave: Will you be live this Saturday night? Will we be live this Saturday night? No, we're gonna be live oh, we got we got an engagement. Go, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, we won't be. But we'll be doing something live 
I don't know if they're following. No, wait a minute, because we got the, the Bears. Bears game is Sunday. Bears game is Sunday. So the following, so two weeks, we'll do something live. Two weeks, Jeff. Yeah, and I'll, what I'll do is I'll I'll put a video ad on there. Because I'm yeah. still getting so used to this, you know. Yeah. No, the re yeah, get, getting back to what I was asking about the YouTube thing, it's like, so you started back in December, and, and I'm sure you sort of shared the same experience that I did, which was like you didn't know this kind of this whole world existed, right? Oh, no. Well, see, okay, I knew it existed because on my other channel, I got videos that date back to, I think, 2008, something like that. Mm -hmm. Or oh, 2006. Okay, see, if it wasn't for my wife, I don't know what the hell I'm coming or going, you know <laughs> what I mean? <laughs> so back in 2006. But a lot of it, I'm not really talking. I'm not doing demos, you know. Um, we were shooting stuff on our little Zoom Q3 camera, and she would upload it because she's more computer literate. But then I started this channel because I started messing around with the phone and saying, look at this. I could do this now, and I could mm. just send it, you know. Yeah. So that's uh, how I got Brian, Brian Stewart wants you to show all your guitars. <laughs> ah. Oh, I'm going to have to do a separate video on it because I got some packed away, man. Okay. Yeah, I think right. we got like 20 or something like that. 20, mine. Okay. So, you know what? I'm going to use you for an excuse next time I want a guitar. Well, Dave's got 20. <laughs> there you go. There you go. But here's the problem. Then when you got to restring them all, it's like a pain in the ass, man, you know? Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, you know what? I think I'm going to wrap this up. So, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in. This was fantastic. Had a great time. Thank you so much, Dave, for coming on. This was Sorry, awesome, thank man. you so much, buddy. Really enjoyed this, brother. Turn your favor, my friends. Hey, I get my laptop and start <laughs> typing with more than one finger. Then no I'll worries, start doing everyone. I'm in the you know same I mean? boat. I'm in the same boat, man. So just to, just to wrap up, again, uh, please subscribe to Dave's channel. I'll make sure his link is in there. If I haven't already put it in there, I'll put his link in there. Um, and yeah, subscribe to everybody else. You know, please subscribe to me if you haven't. Like and subscribe yeah, to the video. Please. That thumbs up. And uh, yeah, give me a thumbs up. That'd be great. And uh, yeah, we'll see you all on. Uh, well, when, when are you up next, Dave? When's your next show? Oh, I'll, I'll do a uh, Saturday afternoon at one. Deb, what time are we leaving? Sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I could I could do Saturday at one. All yeah. right, check out Dave Byron Saturday at one. I'll be doing my solo stream on Thursday at uh, seven o'clock. Nice. So check that out, and uh, yeah, and that's about it. Thanks Guys, again, thank everybody, so for much. watching. Later from the Guitar Hack. Rock on, my friends. Rock you on. guys totally rock. All right, man. Take care. Stay on for a minute. Cheers.